Hello and welcome to The Conscious Capitalists, hosted by two of the co-founders of the Conscious Capitalism Movement and co-authors of the Conscious Capitalism Field Guide from Harvard Business Press, Raj Sisodia and Timothy Henry. Each week, this podcast covers current events and business news and Raj and Timothy's latest thinking on what it takes to build a conscious business. For more information and notes from the show, go to www.theconsciouscapitalists.com. And now, Raj and Timothy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode six of The Conscious Capitalists with myself, Timothy Henry, and my partner in crime here, Raj Sisodia. Hi, Raj. Hi, Timothy. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. And um, I think following along on the theme we've been working on so far, let's work to the next pillar of conscious capitalism, which is really about a, a conscious culture. And... Um, as we do that, I thought maybe we would start with maybe just a definition of what we think culture is, and then, you know, maybe what we think a conscious culture is, what, what's, what's unique about that. Mm -hmm. So maybe to start with, you know, a culture, as I think we use it, is really sort of a pattern of behaviors that are encouraged, discouraged, or tolerated over time by people and systems. So what's important about that is the patterns of behavior. It's how we do things around here. What gets enforced, what gets reinforced, what gets yeah. you in big trouble. And that it's consistent over time. And we come back to it's about the role modeling of leaders, the people, and the systems and what they reinforce. All of which is important and we'll come back to later as sort of the mechanics of yeah. how you enforce or build the culture. But I think that's sort of the baseline of how we would maybe begin to define what culture is. But when we switch now to conscious culture, Raj, what, what do you think is different? Well, it has to be aligned with everything else that we talk about, right? So we have the why question we talked about uh, earlier around purpose. We will talk about the what question in terms of the kind of value we create for stakeholders. And the how is, yeah, as you said, how it feels to work here and how does it feel um, uh, for people to interact with us, right? So the culture is predominantly, we think about it as an internal to the organization thing, but it of course impacts our relationships with other stakeholders. And given that conscious businesses are rooted in purpose, they have core values, uh, and they are genuinely rooted in caring for people as human beings, all of that has to be at a minimum reflected in the culture. And then beyond that, each company might have some unique elements, right? But there has to be this notion of shared values, there has to be a notion of caring at the center of it, uh, and of course, uh, constantly being motivated by the shared purpose uh, of the organization. So all of these things, you know, these four pillars of conscious capitalism, as you know, they're kind of interlocking mm. pieces that fit together with each other and they reinforce each other. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's so right. Uh, to come back to that, this is a system, and this is one of those blocks of the system, but it's the interaction of the four that actually gives you the power and the force that makes a difference in the business. Now, having said that, I think that in the book, The Field Guide, um, we use the acronym TACTILE, and mm -hmm. you get full mm -hmm. credit for that, all acronyms <laughs> that we come up with. They're, they're Rajisms in my mind. <laughs> talk a little bit, Raj, about, you know, when we talk about how to know if you have a conscious culture, we use that acronym tactile. Sure. Before I do that, though, I am reminded of Drucker. You know, Drucker has a quote. I have an acronym for everything, and Drucker has a pithy quote for everything. <laughs> which kind of, he got, to the, he got to the essence of things before most thinkers did in the world. And about culture, he said, and this is almost a cliche now because it's so well known, Culture eats strategy for lunch. Right? Now, when you first heard that, that's pretty radical. I mean, in business school, we teach a lot of courses called strategy, and we don't really teach anything about culture. And this was a big wake-up call to say, listen, your strategy is not a secret. Mm. Every MBA student uh, in any good business school will know the strategy of most leading companies. I mean, we've got detailed cases on those strategies. And yet, why can't we replicate those companies at will because the cultures are unique and they are homegrown and you can't just impose them from the outside and adopt them they have to evolve <clears throat> and so you well, could, I, you could I, almost I, take it I, yeah. I love that raj and, and one of the things i love about that is doug rao the former uh president of trader joe's studied 
for a time with Peter Drucker. And he said when Peter got older, he changed that. He yeah. said, uh, culture doesn't eat strategy for lunch. It eats it for breakfast, <laughs> lunch, yeah. and dinner. That's right. Yeah. And then you could almost go further and say for many companies, not all, but for many conscious companies, culture is strategy. Mm. Right. In other words, it becomes the primary basis for your sustained competitive advantage. Yeah, you know, I Southwest love that. Airlines flies the same Boeing planes and they serve the same airports for the most part. And, you know, there's a lot in every industry that is kind of standard. And yet what makes it different? What is the reason why they have been more successful than anybody else is because of their not only their focus on culture, nobody else even talks very much about culture mm -hmm. in that industry, all those others are learning from Southwest now, uh, but also the fact that it is a deeply people centered culture. Yeah. Right. Their stock, their stock market symbol is love. Uh, you go to their headquarters. I had the opportunity to interview Herb Keller some years ago, and it was an unforgettable day because, first of all, their headquarters at Love Field in uh, in Dallas, the walls are plastered with pictures of people with their children and their families, and maybe a thousand pictures of people hugging Herb Kelleher, mm. right? The employees and Herb Kelleher, right? I mean, the whole thing is, and and after the interview that I did with Herb, and he was walking to the uh, parking lot, it took about 30 minutes because everybody wanted to stop and say hi and get a hug you know, mm. from her. So he embodied that culture in such a deep way. Yeah. And, and that culture of love and care, which is at the root of it, is we love our customers, we love our employees, we love our cities, we love our airports, we love everybody, right? I mean, that's, and if you look at their 50 year track record of sustained growth, sustained profitability, they're the most successful airline by far in the history of the world. Never had a strike, despite being the most heavily unionized mm. uh, of all airlines. Never had a single passenger casualty until a year and a half ago when there was a freak accident. Uh, never laid off a single employee. Even during times like 9-11, today is the anniversary of that day. And remember most airlines, that was like a great depression for them. They laid off 30, 40% of their people, even during the current uh, downturn, Southwest has not laid off anybody. They've offered some early retirements, but pretty generous with those. So again, culture, the power of culture, I think shows up pretty dramatically in a, in a company like Southwest Airlines. And you can see what it can do. And others like JetBlue and others have tried to emulate versions of that culture. But uh, but ultimately it's people at the center. As Herb Kelleher said, the business of business is people, yesterday, today, and forever. And they embody that, I think, very purely. I love that you brought up JetBlue because what's really interesting is that Ann Rhodes at one point had been the head of people at Southwest Airlines and she was one of the co-founders right. of JetBlue and became right. head of people there. Yeah. So people often point to those two airlines and say not only are they very profitable, not only they have great customer service, um, but they're just fun, good, interesting yeah. places right. to, to travel. Right. You, you like the people that you're interacting with. Um, and they're incredibly efficient and profitable at the same time. Yes. And that connection has really been around the people yeah. side of things and how they treat people. Right. You know, the thing is most leaders assume that efficiency is kind of a choice uh, that you can make or you can treat people well, that if you treat people well and you will kind of coddle them and they won't be efficient and they'll just be kind of, you know, happy and lazy. But the fact is that most of these companies have tremendous operational efficiencies that are superior. Uh, Southwest turns around their planes, you know, very rapidly. I mean, they have all kinds of indicators. So that's why, you know, when people are engaged and cared for and, uh, and the turnover is low, they become experienced and, uh, and proficient and, uh, and uh, collaborate. You know, so a lot of efficiency gains happen as yeah. a consequence of treating people well. You know, it's not well, either or. Well, I think that that is a, the great point about Southwest that you bring up is their operational efficiency. And the example I love is the way they have turnaround teams at the airport. You know, the gate agent works with the baggage handlers, works with right. the captains right. and the stewards and stewards to get the plane turned around quickly. And they have a metric yeah. that's a team metric and they work that's as right. a team rather than you know, in many organizations, uh, you know, again, many of the other airlines, it's like very piecemeal. <laughs> I can only tell you here at Heathrow Airport. <laughs> oh yeah, that's not my job. To get an airplane turned around. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's like, uh, I, I liken it to a caste system. 
Mm. You know, conscious companies with conscious cultures, you don't have a caste system. Everybody is together. Yeah. Everybody is, you know, respected and valued. Yeah. Uh, member of the team. In most companies, there's a distinct caste system, right? You've got mm. the professionals, the college educated, then you have the hourly people doing the grunt work. And there's very little respect and uh, yeah. very little regard for that. And, and uh, I think at conscious companies, there's a unified culture. Yeah. At most companies, you can't talk about a single culture because the culture differs by department, it differs by rank, it differs for the executives. You know, they have a different uh, set of norms and private uh, dining rooms and, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. But I think these companies are more egalitarian. I think we can talk about tactile in that regard, you know, that uh, the, the word tactile, of course, means something you can touch and feel. Is something very tangible, right? I mean, this is something I can I can hold and I can feel. Mm. Uh, and the irony is that cultures are invisible, and you can't put them in a box and say, "Here's yeah. a bit of culture." Right? And yet, it is very tangible in these companies. You can walk into a conscious company and feel the energy. Yeah. Right. I sound like a new age person now, but you can literally feel the energy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I always like to say the example of walk into a Whole Foods, walk into a Trader yeah. Joe's, and then walk into a Kroger and Albertsons and tell me if you notice anything yeah. different about the attitude of the staff. Right. And, um, you know, that's the final point, I think, before we maybe we get into tactile is that, yeah. as you said, it's not only an internal piece, it's how everybody who interacts with the organization experiences that and that's particularly right. true of the customer and right. I remember right. John Mackey and Doug Rao one of the first times they met having an argument about which came first the customer right. or the people right. <laughs> and you know I think we ended up sort of saying it's two birds it's two wings of a bird you know that that's you know right. you got you get those yeah. two together that you get lift off and that's, that's right. part of the secret right. sauce to great customer service is is really happy people that are engaged and care about what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's invisible and yet it's very impactful. Mm. But tactile also then stands for uh, the seven key qualities that are common to most conscious cultures, starting with trust. Mm. You know, there's a lot of trust in these, there's trust uh, across employees, they trust each other, right? Uh, there's trust between uh, the leadership uh, of the company and the employees, there's trust with vendors and suppliers with customers, yeah. you know, you're not going to assume that your customer is here to steal something or cheat you or there are great stories of Trader Joe's where a woman bought a bunch of stuff and then, oh my God, I left my purse on the cabinet at home, kitchen counter, you know, and the, the, you know, the person said, ah, no problem. I guess just use my card and pay me next time. Yeah. And she was flabbergasted. She said, oh my, that's, that's incredible. <laughs> like, I mean, this is not you know, it's, it's, a, it's a checkout person. It's not a rich person, but you know, yeah. that level of trust. So trust is a critical thing. Yeah, right? I, 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 I love also the example of Nordstrom's, you know, that uh, when a new hire comes in, they give them a little book and uh, on the first page, they have a statement, the key part of which is, let me read that, Nordstrom rules, rule number one, use best judgment in all situations. There will be no additional rules. That's right, so <laughs> it's a one page. Boy handbook. <laughs> That's right. And the rest are blank for you to learn and write down notes from right. the observing right. the people around you. That's right. But that's, that's an right. ultimate sign of trust in your people. That's right. So that's and that, the, of course, goes with empowerment and, you know, all the other things that happen when you trust people. Right. So I think that's a key element. Uh, let's see. Trust. And then we have authenticity. Mm -hmm. Right. So be you can be who you are. You don't have to act. You don't have to. Most companies you have to put on a mask and armor. Right. And essentially go to battle when mm -hmm. you get to work. I mean, you know, you're capturing market share, you're dealing with office politics, you know, you're navigating the, you know, the sharks. I mean, there's just a lot of that in, in most cultures. Most cultures are filled with fear and stress. And that's not human beings. Human beings yeah. are best motivated intrinsically. Yeah. Right? That they're inspired to do things. I mean, now, the thing is also that we at some level are, you know, sort of operating at an animal level and we can be in a way trained, you know, well, after a while we do start responding to the carrots and sticks, right? <laughs> but that, that's not, that's not, doesn't lead to anything, uh, yeah. uh, anything significant. So again, authenticity, being who you are, right? Uh, showing up as your whole human self, including being vulnerable, mm. being able to express your, your vulnerability, uh, your lack of knowledge in an area, asking for help, all of that is extremely critical. 
And I think it's becoming, um, you know, to be contemporary with some of the topics we have now around diversity and inclusion. You know, a lot of it is around allowing people to be who they are and create an atmosphere where that is supported, yes. whether you're a person of That's color, right. whether you're, you have different sex preferences, male, female, creating environments where people can be themselves and bring their best selves um, is increasingly important. And of course, like all of these things, you know, when you do the right things, great outcomes result. Mm. So you do it because it's the right thing to do, but there's tons of research showing what happens when you have a more diverse workforce, when people are encouraged to bring their whole selves and be themselves. You get a diversity of perspectives, you get more creativity, you get better ideas, you know, mm. you have lower risk, you know, you have better growth, all kinds of things that happen uh, when you have that. So again, authenticity is the second. Uh, the third one is caring. And I think, as I've said probably before, that caring is probably the single biggest factor differentiating a conscious business from a traditional business. Traditional businesses are built on one pillar of what it means to be a human being, which is self-interest, defined narrowly as making money. So the business exists to make money for its owners. Employees go there to make money for their families and for themselves. Customers go there to get the best value or the best deal, right? And suppliers, you know, everybody is there basically from a self-interested perspective, but human beings also have a need to care. Yeah. Right? Our friend and fellow board member, Dave Patnaik wrote a book called Wired to Care, right? Uh, Adam Smith wrote uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiment. So we have a need to care that's even greater in some ways than our drive for self-interest. And yet business and capitalism generally hasn't harnessed that. Yeah. We haven't recognized, let, let's, let's not even use the word harness because that suggests a, a sort of a, uh, instrumental way of thinking about things. Right? We haven't recognized it. The human need to care. My friend Jane Dutton, who's a well-known professor at Michigan, who's probably the world's leading expert on compassion and caring in the workplace. And she said, organizations, we, we are designed to care and organizations can magnify or suppress our capacity for caring. And I also uh, think it doesn't way. mean, I also think it doesn't mean being soft either. I mean, you can no, have caring no. and accountability. You know, I like yeah, to yeah, think of the, sure. you know, as a parent, you know, exactly. we care deeply about our children, yeah, but we yeah, set limits yeah. for them. Yeah. And the best leaders have both caring and create yeah. systems of accountability. And I think Bill George is a great example of, of doing that at Medtronics. Yeah. When he came in as right. CEO, it was a, yeah. it was a caring company. And yeah. he very artfully brought together both the caring part and the accountability part by both empowering and helping people be more accountable, pushing decision-making deeper into the organization. Um, and in that process, you know, held on to that core value of, of caring. That's right. So I think the, the word, you can separate kindness from niceness, right? Mm. So if you have a culture built on niceness, it means you're going to overlook a lot of egregious things. You're going to tolerate things just to be nice. You're going to over, you're going to shy away from necessary conflict, mm. right? That that is needed in order to uh, to ensure that everybody's operating in a way that we you know we, we we want. So it's genuine caring, and I think as Bob Chapman, my co-author on Everybody Matters, puts it, you know, it's you, leadership is the stewardship of the lives entrusted to us. So stewardship of their lives doesn't mean to always saying yes. Caring for them sometimes means saying no setting boundaries, setting limits, and so forth, right? So I yeah. think that's, that's key. But that is, I think, the central thing around which all of this uh, revolves is yeah. the idea of caring at the core of, of businesses, caring about our people, or about our customers, or about our impact on, on the world, on, 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 on the planet, on other species, I mean, all of it, yeah. right? We have to care. And that plays to sort of the, the next letter, T, yeah. which is transparency. And, mm -hmm. um, and really being open and um, allowing information to flow freely. You know, at an extreme, it's open bookkeeping and an open book style of management. Um, mm -hmm. What else does transparency mean to you? Well, I think it's, it's, uh, it's having an open uh, door uh, with regard to leadership and strategy. Um, as I said earlier, strategy is not a secret. A lot of companies go to great lengths 
to try to make it a secret. You know, it's really not. They use a lot of military analogies and sort of top secret and classified and, you know, all of that. Uh, it's really not, right? And, um, and therefore, sharing with people what are the challenges, what are we doing, why are we doing it, you tap into the wisdom of the crowd, as it's called, mm -hmm. right? That collectively, there's so much intelligence, there's so much intuition. We have so many points where we are sensing what's going on in the world. Yeah. That if we open up those channels of communication, that we will then get ideas and we will have uh, uh, innovations that we otherwise would not have. Right? So it's, it's including, it's, a, it's a, an inclusive approach to, uh, to leadership, to strategy, to planning, you know, all of those things. I mean, to me, transparency includes all of that as well. And I also think that, um, you know, going back to the point about strategy in a sense, um, you know, there's some schools of thought that say our strategy, it's unique to us and we have to keep it a secret and we better not let it out because of our competitors knew they would imitate our strategy. Um, and yet, if people in my organization don't understand what our strategy is, it's very hard for them to execute yeah. it. So I yeah. think one of the interesting elements of strategy and transparency is cascading the information around priorities and what's expected if we're going to be executing mm -hmm. against our strategy so that it's relevant at the front lines of the organization. And that, that in that sense, there is full transparency. We're trying to move in this direction. Therefore, this is what's expected of your division. Here's what's expected of your department. Here's what it might mean for your team. And ultimately, here's what it might mean for you. And, and one of the mm -hmm. best examples I saw of that working with a, a retail client was um, cascading the fact that they were trying to grow a new division, a new part of their retail business. And to do that, they needed to cut back on some costs in order to internally fund that kind of growth. So as a part of that effort, they had some cost efficiency metrics that they were putting in place and they got it all the way down to the store construction department. And within that, the fixtures department, where the fixtures people were going around and looking and saying, hey, if we can decrease the cost of fixtures by 10%, then we're helping to grow the business by helping us launch this new retail concept we have. So that transparency of making it you know, meaningful to people yeah. Yeah. of what we're trying to do and make it relevant yeah. to them. It's not just we're trying to cut yeah. costs by 10%. I'm helping to grow our yeah. new retail concept. Got it. That, 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 that kind of transparency is not just about the openness, but it's also about the relevance and the education of people and alignment yeah. um, throughout I, the organization. I'm reminded of a friend of mine as a CEO, was a CEO of a big computer company in India called HCL, Vineet Nayar. And he wrote a really good book called Employees First, Customers Second. But one of the things he talks about in there is, uh, is, is that on their internal website, uh, he had a section called My Challenges as a leader. You know, what am I trying to do? What am I struggling with, et cetera, right? Hmm. And there are thousands of very smart people working in that company. Yeah. The idea is that you know, I don't have to struggle with these by myself, right? And uh, so they got lots of wonderful ideas. Yeah. how to deal with everybody's challenges by opening up and having that level of transparency. It does require a leader yeah. to have that level of consciousness that enables them to be open and vulnerable and admit that they don't know or they're struggling. Yeah. Right? So again, all of these things go together, these elements of tactile. Yeah, there's another great example, which is the CEO of Accenture, Julie Sweet. She has a set of learning objectives that she creates for herself each quarter and she publishes them to the whole organization, sort of saying, listen, this is my journey yeah. as a leader. Yeah. Here's my learning agenda for the next quarter, and, yeah. and I'm gonna report out to you how I'm doing, <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I expect yeah. your feedback. And yeah. that's her way of role modeling a certain transparency of what she expects from leaders across the organization. Yeah, and, and you know, Ramon Mendiola Sanchez of FIFCO does something similar, one of the companies we wrote about in the, in the field guide, as well as in the healing organization. You know, they set these ambitious goals and then they publicize them. Mm. They're not internal. Talk about not keeping things secret. They are known to the world, not only to all your employees. Mm. Uh, goals around, uh, especially around their footprints mm. uh, with the environment, right? Yeah. And they say, we, we aim to achieve this by this date. You know, they just put it out there. And then 
every time they've done that, they have achieved those goals because everybody then uh, gets uh, you know energized and inspired to try yeah. to do things to to help further that. Well, now the I, the I stands for integrity. And Raj, you maybe want to intro that for us? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, of course, a word that encompasses ethics and, uh, you know, legal compliance at a, at a bare minimum, of course, but also uh, being aligned, right, uh, between your thoughts and your words and your actions and your values, right? So there's, there's alignment between all of those things. So integrity is one of those sort of super values, right? For us yeah. as human beings, as well as for organizations that, that encompasses a lot more, uh, many other values within it. It's, it. it's a given, I mean, you have to have integrity. It's also relatively rare, hmm. uh, you know, to find it in the world, but you see, we recognize it when we see it and we make tough choices and you walk away, you know, from certain opportunities uh, because you are staying true. To who you are, who, who you know, who you what you say that you care about. You know, there's there's no gap between those the words and actions and and, uh, and, uh, and values. Well, I often think that a great example of that is to ask a management team or a leadership team, what are you unwilling to tolerate? Like like what are the mm -hmm. things that are we're just not going to compromise on? That's right. And I was reminded of working with one client who was a professional service organization that was introducing a diversity program, and one of their senior partners who'd been around for a long time, um, you know, started making, you know, side comments about it. It wasn't clear that he was on board. And uh, uh, the result was they had to make a difficult situation, uh, difficult decision. Uh, is this guy going to stay with us or not? And they ultimately said, uh, no, I think that, that this is one thing we're not willing to because it, we're, we're not an in integrity if we say diversity inclusion is important. And one of our senior partners is, is really not going to do that. So he took an early retirement. Mm -hmm. So I think the, um, the next thing is the, is the L, the, the learning element. Mm -hmm. Want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, Peter Senge talked about the learning organization years ago. Um, Carol Dweck has talked about the growth mindset as an essential attribute for all human beings, especially leaders, right? So if we are not learning and growing, then essentially we're decaying and dying. And in a conscious organization, there's constant learning at an organizational level, but also at an individual level. So we encourage people and we enable people to continue to grow and evolve as human beings in their self-awareness, in their clarity of purpose, in their capacities as, as leaders, you know, all of those. So I think the Container Store is a good example of a company that uh, provide something like 250 hours of training mm. to their people every year when the industry average in retail is, I don't know, five or six hours. Yeah. Right? But there's just a tremendous emphasis on that. So again, enabling that to be the case, not only for the senior executives and not only for the high so-called high potentials, which I always have an allergic reaction to, which human being is not a high potential human being, you know, uh, but for everybody. It's, yeah. it's democratized. And I think that's what the last E is, I remember, is egalitarian, right? And so it's, it's for everybody. It's not just reserved for this tier of people that all of these things apply to everybody, including the opportunity to learn and grow. Yeah, yeah, I like that. The, the, in, you know, the egalitarianism and, in a sense, the empowerment that flows with that. You know, those two E's sort of go together. We could almost have two E's at the end of tactile. And I know we've gone back and forth right. in time between yeah. empowerment and, and engagement. But I think, yeah. you know, sorry, um, empowerment and egalitarianism. And I, and I think, you know, you, you can't have one without the other. Um, right. And I think not, with trust, as we said, with trust, you already kind of, you know, that, that leads to empowerment. Uh, but I, yeah, I agree. So that, that, uh, that's definitely a key part of that. So I think that the thing for executives to be thinking about as they go through tactile is to sort of sit with their teams and ask, okay, where are we on these things? On a scale of one to five, you know, five is high, one is low. Let's just try to score ourselves on these and see what that means for us. And then from that place, begin to ask yourself, what can we do to improve in this area? What's our agenda for building trust, yeah. authenticity, et cetera? 
I would also go beyond the executive team and actually ask our people, you know, because sometimes there's a way different perception. I know it, usually there's a way different perception. Almost you know, always. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Right? So we have to uh, actually ask the people who are living and breathing the culture every day or experiencing it yeah. in order to understand. Right? And yeah. then, of course, as we will talk about, I think, next time, you know, there will be unique elements to your culture. So you mm -hmm. can, everybody can use tactile, but depending on the unique industry or the unique history of the company or the values of the founders, et cetera, there will be some unique values. So Raj, just holding the culture discussion aside, which we'll come back to in our next episode, I also noted that in the, in the news this week, uh, related to sort of conscious capitalism and, and the, the way people are now looking at businesses, the CEO of Rio Tinto uh, has announced that he'll step down, the head of their iron ore business will step down, and the head of the investor relations group are all going to step down. And what's driving that is um, in Australia um, uh, earlier this year, um, they opened up an, ore, an iron ore mine. And in doing that, they desecrated a 46,000 year old Aboriginal site. There were two caves uh, in this part of the world that in building their mine, they desecrated. And um, the pressure from shareholders has been such and continual that the board was asked to do an investigation to try to understand how could we go and do something like this. So I think it's fascinating to sort of see how investors are increasingly paying attention to how businesses are operating and how senior leaders are leading. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we live in a world where there are no secrets and there, you know, there's, there's total transparency and all of our stakeholders care about all of these kinds of things and the consequences are swift and often dire when we say, so that's a good thing, right? The, you know, we reward uh, good behavior and we swiftly deal with bad behavior in many companies now compared to what we used to have. Uh, hard to imagine that this would have happened 10 years ago, but we're at a tipping point with conscious capitalism and this kind of thinking. So uh, maybe we'll see more of this as we go forward. We'll come back to that next time, Raj. So thanks very much for your time today. And thanks everybody for your time and attention. And as always, um, have any comments or thoughts, come to theconsciouscapitalists.com and leave a message and whatever podcast station you're listening on, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Timothy. Look forward to our next chat on this.